I am excited to go through all of Wilds of Eldraine. This set is coming out in um, this weekend is the pre-release weekend, and then the weekend after is the actual full release. We're going to go through each of the colors, and then we're going to go into the multicolored cards, and then we're going to do the colorless and the land cards uh, with little breaks in between to stretch our legs and, and refill water, basically just to kind of reset emotionally. Um, if you're watching this later on YouTube, um, I said this a lot yesterday, but this time I mean it. If you're watching this later on YouTube, I appreciate you being here. I appreciate you watching the videos on this channel, uh, saying hello. If you can subscribe to the channel, it makes our uh, life a lot easier and better. If you want to, definitely leave a comment below and let me know what cards you're most excited about, what um, cards maybe I'm getting wrong like I have the wrong impression of or maybe don't know very well. Um, like we did yesterday, I'm going to go over the new mechanics as we come across them for each and every folder so that if you're on YouTube and you just watch the blue set review, um, you're not missing any information about any of the set mechanics. There are a couple of new mechanics, um, but mostly it's evergreen stuff that's been around for a little while. So let's jump right into it. I'm just going to grab a swig first. I'm also recording this locally because I don't trust Twitch VODs right now. As you can probably assume. Um, okay. So our first card is the Archon of the Wild Rose. It is two white white for a 4-4 four, four Archon flying. Other creatures you control that are enchanted by auras you control have base power and toughness 4-4 four, four, and have flying. That's pretty cool. Um, this is going to go really well in that um, enchantments deck. The sort of early versions of the boggles kind of thing. Uh, this card is going to be really strong in this set. Um, I, I also neglected to mention that we're we're returning to Eldraine for the first time. Uh, Thrones of Eldraine came out a few a few years back, and it was beloved by many. It kind of has uh, a fairy tale source for its narrative and its world inspirations. So think Grimm's fairy tales um, and all that kind of stuff as we go through this. That's basically the universe that this plane is set in, is fairy tales. So uh, there's lots of enchantments and, and stuff like that. Archon of the Wild Rose is going to be great in standard. I think four mana is a little bit steep. I think you might be able to switch out like one of the Catildas in the enchantment standard deck for an Archon of the Wild Rose, but uh, that's yet to be seen. Hopefully, because... Um, hopefully th we'll get to, to see this being played in standard. Uh, it, it seems to be a pretty solid card. Starting off strong with white for sure. Then we've got Archon's Glory. Um, and this has one of the new mechanics called Bargain. So Archon's Glory is a one white instant with Bargain. So Bargain is kind of like multi-kicker or kicker. Um, you pay an extra cost when you cast it and then you get an added bonus to the card. So this has bargain. Target creature gets plus two, plus two until end of turn. If it was bargained, so if you sacrificed an artifact, enchantment, or token as you cast it, uh, that creature also gets flying and lifelink until end of turn. I think this is pretty good. I think this is going to swing. Um, it's definitely going to swing a limited game or two for sure um whether or not this replaces other combat tricks uh white generally has a lot of interactive combat tricks versus like pump up your own stuff combat tricks so i don't know if this is going to see much play outside of limited but it's a fun card next up we have armory mice one and a white for a three one mouse creature with celebration so celebration is kind of like the old constellation 
keyword uh, where celebration is triggered if two or more non-land permanents enter your enter the battlefield uh, under your control this turn. So uh, Armory Mice is a 3-1, but if you've managed to trigger celebration, it gets plus 0, plus 2 uh, until end of turn, which is, is pretty good. It becomes a 3-3 three, three, um, for only 2 mana. It's not bad. Uh, I mentioned this a lot in our first attempt at doing this set review is that from the outside looking in, it's very difficult to tell whether or not celebration is going to be easily triggered. There's a lot of permanents that can enter the battlefield. There's lots of tokens. There's lots of auras. Um, there's tons of enchantments. So I'm kind of on the fence as to whether or not celebration should be looked at as something that's going to happen often or something that's going to happen rarely. Um, if it is rare, then stuff like Armory Mice becoming a 3-3 for only 2 mana isn't super strong, uh, but it's also not that bad. So that's Celebration, one of the new uh, keywords. And then we've got Besotted Knight. So uh, you can see here that there's an adventure on this card. This is an old throwback to the original Eldraine. Basically, because Eldraine is set in a story tale or fairy tale storybook uh, universe, there's this side mechanic of adventures so some creatures enchantments um cards have an adventure attached to them basically it's a sorcery or instant that you can cast from your hand and when you do cast something that has an adventure you you cast the adventure side and then the card goes into exile when the card's in exile you can then play the full card from exile uh, but you cannot cast the adventure side of it the adventure portion of it um once the card has left your hand so if you play the creature you can't play the adventure you have to get the card back to your hand in order to play the adventure side um it's mostly set up so that you do the adventure first and then bring the rest of the card into the game so besotted knight is three and a white for a three three human knight with an adventure uh betroth the beast for one white mana, you get a sorcery. Create a royal roll token attached to target creature you control. And this is another new mechanic called rolls. And they're basically aura tokens. There's six total. One of them is negative. It's called cursed roll. Um, it turns whatever creature that is attached to it into a 1-1. One, one. Um, but there's five other rolls that all kind of give positive uh, changes to your creatures. And so this one is... Uh, plus one, plus one, and has ward one. That's the royal roll. Uh, then there's like a monster roll and, and wicked roll, yada, yada. Uh, we'll get to those as we run across them. But this is a new kind of aura token mechanic that's coming in Wilds of Eldraine. And it's pretty cool. I think it's going to be neat. Um, the actual Besotted Knight has no text. It's just flavor text. So it's a it's an okay card. Next up, we have Break the Spell. One white mana for an instant destroy target enchantment. If a permanent you controlled or a token was destroyed this way, draw a card. So this is interesting because obviously there's a lot of enchantments in this set, um, but it's also giving you a bonus if you target your own enchantment. So things like uh, these aura tokens, if you want to get the extra draw card, you can destroy one of your rolls that you've, you've put on one of your creatures, but also you can destroy, um, uh, an aura or enchantment that your opponent has put on one of your creatures as well. So it kind of gives you the tools to defend yourself or destroy something powerful that your opponents have. So I, I like this. I think this is going to be big in limited for sure. It's also probably going to be a decent sideboard card um, against the white-green enchantment deck. So we'll have to see uh, how that plays out in actuality. Next up, we have Charmed Clothier. Four and a white for a 3-3 three, three Fairy Advisor. So there's tons of fairies in this set. Uh, Charmed Clothier has Flying. When it enters the battlefield, create a royal roll token attached to another target creature you control. And again, the royal roll is plus one, plus one, and has ward one. Uh, one other note about these aura rolls is that you can only have one attached to a creature at any time. So if you're forced to attach a roll to a creature or you want to change the roll, you have to get 
the the old roll falls off basically goes to the graveyard and then disappears um, in order to put the new one on so next up we have cheeky house mouse one white for a two one mouse it has an adventure called squeak by for one white it's a sorcery target creature you control gets plus one plus one until end of turn and can't be blocked by creatures with power three or greater this turn and then the mouse side of it just has uh, flavor text. So it's an okay card. I think being able to squeak by is going to be powerful. Also having a 2-1 for one mana is not bad either. But uh, it's a pretty st standard card. I I'd say this is about par. I like it. Cooped up is next. It's one and a white for an enchantment aura. So we do have normal enchantments. Um, normal auras. It's not just the token stuff. Uh, this one says enchanted creature can't block or attack. You can pay two and a white to exile enchanted creature. So this is a nice little lockdown, something we see in white quite often. Um, and this is just the newest version of it. I like when Wizards is forced to kind of reiterate on things that are popular or have happened quite a bit in these sets. So I like this new one. Cursed Courtier is next. Two and a white for a 3-3 human noble with lifelink. When Cursed Courtier enters the battlefield, create a cursed roll token attached to it. So this is that negative roll I was talking about. Enchanted creature is a 1-1. Um, basically, you get a 3-3 with lifelink, but it turns into a 1-1. And you have to find a way to remove the curse in order to make the best use out of the card. Flavor-wise, it's a really fun thing. I think that cost versus benefit is kind of poor. I think this card would have been really, really cool if it was one mana to cast. It becomes You play a 3-3 three, three that becomes a 1-1, one, one, and hopefully by the time you get to turn 3 or turn 2, you have the ability to remove that curse from it, and it becomes a 3-3. Three, three. I think playing it for 3, it should just be a 3-3 three, three with lifelink. The fact that it becomes a 1-1 one, one immediately is makes this card pretty bad flavor wise it's great but the card is bad discerning financier is next two and a white for a two three human noble at the beginning of your upkeep if an opponent controls more lands than you create a treasure token and then you can pay two and a white choose another player that player gains control of target treasure you control you draw a card so this one's a little weird um not quite sure how this is going to play out uh, but it's it's neat the art is fantastic but next up we have dutiful griffin three white white for a four four griffin with flying two and a white sacrifice two enchantments return dutiful griffin from your graveyard to your hand so this is like a reoccurring four four flyer which is pretty decent um it is kind of steep cost wise it costs five to cast it initially and then it costs three, and you have to sacrifice two enchantments to bring it back. Uh, luckily, all of these aura tokens count as enchantments, so maybe you're going to have enough. It, it, it's not strong, but it's okay. Eerie Interference is next. Two and a white for an instant. Prevent all damage that would be dealt to you and creatures you control this turn by creatures. So this is nice because it's kind of a white play on phasing out um but more in the vein of like green fog abilities and the nice thing is is that they specify damage by creatures i think it's it's great that they don't go full green with this card and make all damage reduced and it's specifically creatures so if you're up against a wide board or big stompy creatures like this is a cool card to have um and I, I love the art as, as well. It's pretty cool. Next up, we have Expel the Interlopers. Three white white for a sorcery. Choose a number between 0 and 10. Destroy all creatures with power greater than or equal to the chosen number. Uh, this is going to be really powerful because uh, the mono white humans deck in standard and even like pioneer and stuff is very strong. But you don't have access to a lot of the great white board wipes. Uh, Sunfall, Farewell, yada yada, uh, because you're going to lose your giant board. The whole point of your deck is to get this giant board. And most of the time, you don't have all of the tools to rebuild really quickly. So 
people don't play those board wipes often enough in the white humans deck because they don't want to risk their stuff. This lets you uh, choose a number that's higher than the power of all of your stuff, hopefully knocking out your opponent's best stuff. Um, and I think that that makes it very viable for a one of or a sideboard card in these mono white go wide decks. Uh, next up, we have Frostbridge Guard, one and a white for a 2-2 Elemental Soldier. It has an activated ability, two and a white, tap it to tap target creature. This is going to come up a little bit in blue and white. Uh, the, basically, the color combination... Um, uh, what is it called? The archetype is uh, tapping things, so you're going to see a lot of ways to tap things and then payoffs for when you do tap things uh this guy's fine i think this is going to be a good pickup in uh, a limited deck for sure people don't prioritize these tapping creatures very highly in limited and we've seen them pay off in big ways in the last few sets so i think frostbridge guard is going to be all right next up we have gallant pie wielder this awesome dwarf wielding two pies um it's two and a white for a two three dwarf knight with first strike and then we see the return of celebration here uh gallant pie wielder has double strike as long as two or more non-land permanents has entered the battlefield under your turn so that's pretty cool uh standalone it's a two three with first strike for three it's probably a little below par uh but it's not too bad it's gonna be a, a decent uncommon in, in limited for sure also, the dwarfs are, are pretty great, so. Um, Glass Casket is next. This is a return of a beloved um, kind of freeze spell. It is one and a white for an artifact. When Glass Casket enters the battlefield, exile target creature and opponent controls with mana value 3 or less until Glass Casket leaves the battlefield. So this is like your portable holes, your ossifications. Uh, it's just another good quality white uh, control piece. This is a reprint from the original Thrones of Eldraine, so it's people are going to be stoked that this is coming back. Uh, we have Hopeful Vigil next. One and a white for an enchantment. Hopeful Vigil enters the battlefield. Create a 2-2 white knight creature token with Vigilance. When Hopeful Vigil is put into a graveyard from the battlefield, scry two, and then you can pay two and a white to sacrifice Hopeful Vigil, which is pretty good. Um, it's a bit of value. You get the enchantment enters the battlefield trigger as well because it's just a one and a white uh, for an enchantment. You get a 2-2 out of it. Um, and then once it leaves you get to scry to it's got some value there so i think it makes it an above par kind of card but um we'll have to see how that plays out next up we have kellen's light blades one on a white for an instant with bargain so again you can sacrifice an artifact enchantment or token as you cast the spell and you get that extra added bonus uh, kellen's light blade deals three damage to target attacking or blocking creature if it was bargained destroy that creature instead so this is a great use of the bargain mechanic where, you know, for one and a white, you deal three damage to target attacking or blocking creature. That's pretty standard. Um, we've seen that come up a lot in the control white decks. There was um, the Emperor's Last Stand or whatever it was in Kamigawa that basically did the exact same thing. But now we've got the added benefit of if you can bargain this card, you get to destroy that creature outright no matter how much health it has. So I like this uh, for the bargain. Um, and then it's just kind of a standard uh, removal spell in its normal form, which makes it pretty decent. Knight of Doves is next. Two and a white for a 1-3 human knight. Whenever an enchantment you control is put into a graveyard from the battlefield, create a 1-1 white bird creature token with flying. So this is something we saw in Dominaria United, where a seemingly innocuous card that makes 1-1 flyers uh, basically took over all of Limited for, that, for the beginning few months of that set. 
and I think this one's going to do almost as much damage as that one because there's going to be a lot of enchantments going to the graveyard, especially with these new aura tokens with the rolls. Um, when those rolls fall off or that creature dies, those rolls technically go to the graveyard before they are removed from the game. So each one of those triggers um, a new bird. And this doesn't cap it at once per turn. So, you know, there's a chance that you get two, three, four birds per turn um, if you set yourself up. So I think Knight of Doves is going to be pretty strong in limited. It's definitely not going to find a place in in other formats, I don't think. Maybe Commander, but... Uh, Moment of Valor is next. Two and a white for an instant. Choose one. Untap target creature. It gets plus one, plus oh, and, and gains indestructible until end of turn. Or destroy target creature with power four or greater. So this is that smite card that we're used to seeing from, from white. It's one mana more than the previous smites, but you also get that added... Uh, value of being able to choose to untap your creature and give it indestructible so i think that you know having surprise blockers is pretty strong but people aren't normally open to that surprise i think that normally when you a player attacks they have all of their mana open so if you play this and you try to untap a surprise blocker and get in there and kill something important they have the ability to respond to that and nullify this, but it's nice that we've got the two choices at least. The next one is Moonshaker Cavalry. Uh, this is a pretty big card. Five white, white, white for a 6-6 six, six Spirit Knight with flying, uh, which is not great on its own. That's eight mana for a 6-6 six, six Flyer. Not cool. Um, but when Moonshaker Cavalry enters the battlefield, Creatures you control gain flying and get plus X plus X until end of turn, where X is the number of creatures you control. So I know that a lot of those go wide decks, especially the mono white humans one, um, don't want to still be playing by turn eight. But if you have this card and you play this on turn eight or you find a way to make it cheaper and play it on turn six or seven, um, this is game ending right there. Uh, that's huge. That wins you the game. Uh, most of the time, people can't react to that well. So I think this card is going to be one of the biggest cards in this set, especially if we just narrow our view to just white. This one's going to be huge. Next up, we have Plunge into Winter. One and a white for an instant. Tap up to one target creature. Scry one, then draw a card. Again, we're seeing that white tapping things uh, mechanic and this gets the added benefit of scrying one and then drawing a card so it's it's nice to have that extra benefit that's well worth paying two mana for uh, obviously sagas are coming back eldraine is a fairy tale so there's lots of stories there's lots of tales um, so sagas make a triumphant return and I don't know if we're going to see many sets without Sagas. I think that they're powerful enchantments and people have been really liking some of the designs on them. Ever since Kamigawa came out, the, almost every set has had Sagas. So I think that we're going to see them around for quite a bit. You might only get one or two per set, but I think that it makes sense to kind of not only flush out the story, but introduce some, some cool and staggering kind of card pieces. So chapter one is exile a target creature. Chapter two is target creature you control gets plus two, plus two, and gains flying until end of turn. And then chapter three is return the exiled card to the battlefield under its owner's control. So if your opponent has something scary, you can phase it out for a turn, two turns. Um, but if you have something that you want uh, to blink, you could also do that as well. Say... You could even blink your Moon Shaker Cavalry so that you get that ETB trigger a second time if your opponent doesn't have anything you need to get around. If they have something that you, you haven't been able to attack for turns because they have something on their board that is stopping you from doing so, uh, this is great because you can just exile it for a couple turns and then it, they get it back. So you exile 
you make your room for your attacks and then you attack and then the blocker or whatever comes back it's not bad uh, protective parents is next two and a white for a three two human peasant when protective parents dies create a young hero roll token attached to up to one target creature you control so the, again this is another one of those roll aura tokens um the young hero roll says whenever this creature attacks if its toughness is three or less put a one one counter on it obviously this makes the young hero aura token more powerful if you put it on a low level creature like a one one or a one two or something like that because you're gonna get um a couple of one one counters out of it every time you attack it's not bad next up is regal bunny corn this is my sleeper pick for uh, actually i don't know if it's going to be a sleeper um this is one of the best cards in white regal bunny corn is one in a white for a star star rabbit unicorn regal bunny corn's power and toughness are equal to the number of non-land permanents you control so that's humans that's tokens that's um enchantments this is going to be big in the enchantment deck because those can get really out of hand and I think that it's going to, you know, be a pretty solid card in that format. It could also, you know, go in the, the humans deck, but it's not going to trigger any of the human matters abilities. So that's, you know, weigh, weigh that with what whatever weight you'd like. Uh, Triumphant Return is next. One and a white for a sorcery. Return target creature card with mana value three or less from your graveyard to the battlefield. Create a young hero roll token attached to it. Again, that's the young hero. Uh, whenever this creature attacks, if its toughness is three or less, put a 1-1 one, one counter on it. Um, this is pretty good. I like it to um, return something cheap from the graveyard directly to the battlefield. It is a sorcery, so you have to do that on your turn and go down two mana, but I think that that's kind of the payoff is you get to return it directly to the battlefield but it's at sorcery speed so you're limited as to when you can play it next up next up we have rhyme for rhyme for reindeer three and a white for a three four elk whenever an enchantment enters the battlefield under your control tap target creature and opponent controls this is going to be a combo piece and a real pain in the butt in limited, especially if you get those enchantment decks really put together. Otherwise, I don't know if it's going to find a home in say, the actual standard enchantment deck, the white green one. Um, it's not bad, I wish I had flying. It's obviously flying in the photo, so or in the art. So I think it, it's weird that it's not flying. But I think it would be a little bit m more relevant if it had flying and could actually attack. Otherwise, you're just playing this to get those triggered abilities. There's no cap on how many times you can trigger that ability as well. So that makes it a little bit stronger. Next up is Savior of the Sleeping. Two in a white for a 2-3 human knight with vigilance. Whenever an enchantment you control is put into a graveyard from the battlefield, put a 1-1 counter on Savior of the Sleeping. So this is one of those commons that kind of gets out of hand uh, if you put it in the right deck. Obviously, all of the aura tokens are enchantments. And when they go to the graveyard, whenever you replace them, whenever your creature dies, yada yada, um, this could easily get, you know, two, three, four, five, one, one counters just a few turns after you've played it. So this is one of those commons that, that can get out of hand. Well, I'll wait to see how often people are drafting it, but uh, it looks pretty good. Uh, next up is Slumbering Keep Guard. For one white, you get a 1-1 one, one Human Knight. Whenever an enchantment enters the battlefield under your control, scry one. You can pay two and a white. Slumbering Keep Guard gets plus one, plus one until end of turn for each enchantment you control. Uh, this is another one of those cards that I think might squeak into the enchantment deck. It's cheap early. You get to trigger a bunch of scries, so you get a lot more control after the early game. And, you know, 
it could become a 6-6 for three mana uh, for a turn and swing. Um, you don't have to tap it to activate this ability. It's also, you can do it more than once. Um, so if you have six mana, you can make it like a 12-12 or a 10-10. Um, I think this is going to be really good. This is my sleeper pick for white. In all formats, not just limited. Uh, Solitary Sanctuary is next. Two and a white for an enchantment. When Solitary Sanctuary enters the battlefield, tap target creature and opponent controls and put a stun counter on it. So stun counters, to remind everyone, is a counter that stops a, a card from being untapped. So if you were to go to untap a creature with a stun counter on it, you instead remove that stun counter and the next time you can untap it, it will untap as normal. Um, you can put multiple stun counters on something. You can multiply stun counters. Um, you can proliferate stun counters. So you have to get rid of all the stun counters before you can untap a card as normal. So that's pretty strong for three mana to just kind of lock something down for possibly like two turns. Uh, whenever you tap an untapped creature and opponent controls, put a 1-1 counter on target creature you control. So that's really strong as well because obviously you get the initial trigger where you get to tap something. If you pick something that's untapped, you get to immediately put that 1-1 counter on something. And then there's a ton of cards in blue and white that uh, let you tap your opponent's stuff. So I feel like you're going to get this trigger a bunch of times. You could, you could almost easily do it every turn and put a 1-1 counter on something. So I like that. Plus, the, it's an enchantment, so it's going to trigger all the other enchantments entering the battlefield triggers. Solid card. Next up, we have Spellbook Vendor. One and a white for a 2-2 human peasant with vigilance. At the beginning of combat on your turn, you may pay one. When you do, create a sorcerer roll token attached to target creature you control. So sorcerer is another one of the new rolls. Um, sorcerer reads... Enchanted creature gets plus one, plus one, and has whenever this creature attacks, scry one. Um, so that's a pretty good one. Most of the rules have like just a simple plus one, plus one. Um, and this one lets you scry when you attack. So that's pretty decent. Uh, next up is Stockpiling Celebrant. Two and a white for a 3-2 Dwarf Knight. When Stockpiling Celebrant enters the battlefield, you may return another target non-land permanent you control to its owner's hand. If you do, scry two. You may return another target non-land permanent you control to its owner's hand. So you can bounce um, a roll that's been put on your creature if you want. Um, you can bounce anything of yours. It's not great. It's not a great card. Next up, we have Stroke of Midnight. Two and a white for an instant. Destroy target non-land permanent. Its controller creates a 1-1 white human creature token. Um, this is a pretty powerful removal spell. Obviously, giving your opponent a 1-1 human isn't fantastic, but it's flavorful because, you know, when Midnight strikes, the powerful, beautiful thing become goes back into being just a normal person. Um, so I like that. A tale for the ages, one and a white for an enchantment. Enchanted creatures you control get plus two, plus two. This is really strong. Um, I think this is going to go in the standard enchantment deck. I think this is going to be huge in limited. Um, yeah, I think it's just solid all around. Three blind mice is next. Two and a white for a enchantment saga. Chapter 1 is create a 1-1 white mouse creature token. Chapter 2, create a token that's a copy of target token you control. Chapter 3, create a token that's a copy of target token you control. So keep in mind that it's not specifying you have to target that white mouse creature token you made. If you have another token of like a 10-10, say you make a Terralask um, token or some giant Merit Large um, thing... Uh, you can copy that token. It's just a token you control. You don't have to choose the mouse. Uh, chapter 4 is creatures you control get plus 1, plus 1, and gain vigilance until end of turn. So it's nice to kind of like 
the first three chapters are building your board and then the fourth one is use your board i like that uh next up is to unveil a guide three and a white for a two three fairy scout with flying to unveil guide also has celebration so it gets plus one plus oh and has lifelink if you can trigger celebration um it's not great it just becomes a three three with lifelink I think for four mana, this should already be a 3-3 three, three with lifelink, but we'll see. It's just, it feels like they've powered down the common creatures a lot and powered up the rare creatures quite a lot. So it feels kind of weird. Next up is Unassuming Sage, one and a white for a 2-2 two, two human peasant wizard. When Unassuming Sage enters the battlefield, you may pay two. If you do, create a Sorcerer Roll token attached to it. So again, the Sorcerer Roll is whenever this creature attacks, scry one, and it gets plus one, plus one. So it's kind of just a flavor card. Um, you know, it's an Unassuming Sage. You think that they're helpful, but actually there's some crazy Sorcerer in disguise. Uh, I like it. It's not great, but it's fine. It costs you four mana total to do all that, so it's not good value. Uh, next up is a Virtue of Loyalty. So there is a virtue cycle in this set. Um, each color has a virtue uh, based on the specific castle that is aligned with that color. So Virtue of Loyalty is three white white for an enchantment. At the beginning of your end step, put a 1-1 counter on each creature you control and untap those creatures. Obviously, you can tell by this virtue that all of the virtue cards are going to be very powerful. Um, this one is no exception. Being able to swing out every turn and untap all of your creatures in order to block the next turn. It's pseudo vigilance. It's fantastic. It has an adventure side of it. Arden Vale Fealty. So Castle Arden Vale is the white castle, obviously. Um, Arden Vale Fealty is is one and a white for an instant create a 2-2 white knight creature token with vigilance so the fact that the token that the adventure makes has vigilance but the enchantment gives pseudo vigilance is kind of weird um but it's still very powerful and then the last card for white is where fox bodyguard uh, we unfortunately did not receive very much story or introduction to these were foxes they show up quite a bit in this set but we haven't really been told much about them and they're very cool so i hope we get to know more about them soon uh where where fox bodyguard is one white white for a 2-2 elf fox knight creature with flash when where fox bodyguard enters the battlefield exile up to one target non-fox creature until where fox bodyguard leaves the battlefield then you can pay one and a white to sacrifice where fox bodyguard and gain two life so this is really cool because white um exile creatures tend to kind of be omnidirectional you want to take your opponent's best thing um but because this has a sacrifice ability built into it that also gains you two life this is very good to protect your important thing um if you have something that you cannot afford to lose on the battlefield, you can flash this out, exile it with Werefox Bodyguard, and then at a later moment when you have the ability to use that important piece to its full potential, you sacrifice Werefox Bodyguard, which sounds like a bad thing, but you also get two life. So it's kind of like sacrificing a food, um, and then you get your important piece back so it's very powerful that it's a dual-sided kind of exile creature um i think this is really neat design and i hope that people pick up on this because this card is really cool um and that's it for white i will go back and point out that my pick for sleeper is the slumbering keep guard which is ironic because it's my sleeper pick this card is going to be bonkers, I promise you. Um, it's going to be strong. And then, obviously, the Werefox Bodyguard is, is pretty cool. So, I like to, that card as well. 